We all watch it, and there's going to be big changes in the way we watch it in the future. What am I talking about? Television. Over recent years, we've witnessed broadcast technology evolve at an unprecedented rate, and this one's no exception. But luckily, I'm here with John Dunlop, and he knows all about these exciting changes. John, excite me. Well, um, high definition is one of the biggest and most exciting things that's going to come along in the next few years. <laughs> it's going to change things dramatically. You can actually see the blades of grass on the football pitch. You can see the people in the, in the crowd on, a, on the cinema. You can see much better... Um, uh, um, contrast ratio so therefore you can see the blacks and it gives it much much more re realism. And uh, do I need any special equipment in order to watch high definition television? Most people will have to buy a new television screen and that means a screen which is HD ready. Um, they've tried to make it very easy for the public to find out exactly which TVs are HD ready and which ones aren't by a big yellow label across it um, but you will need that and you'll need to find some way of getting high definition signals that will either be through satellite cable or terrestrial transmissions so a lot of changes to come but it's going to get a lot better and these changes are mainly due to the research and development of new technologies from companies like Sony well, Sony have been developing high definition for just over 20 years now, but only really in the last few years have we finally come to a point where we have high definition for everyone, from the consumer right the way through to George Lucas with Star Wars. And I see you've got a, a bit of kit with you today. That's right, that's right. We're just sort of showing here really how the kind of, we've almost crossed over with consumer now. So this is just basically a professional version of a camera you can buy in any consumer high street store. So we really do have the affordability giving everyone access to this new world of super high quality. Now it's not just about the high definition is it? It's not just about high definition, you're quite right. Quality is the fundamental most important thing but it's also how we use that video material and I think the demands for production companies now and the pressures they're put upon is to turn around productions much more quickly and that's why we have a new system called XD Cam HD so it still maintains the quality of high definition but because it's now disc based, like a DVD for example, you can access the material very quickly, you can skip to chapters very quickly, you can clear all your material off the disc very quickly. So your whole production process is increased in its efficiency and its flexibility. Now, now we've seen consumer and obviously now we've seen the way you can record it, but I understand you've got some real high end stuff in today as well. That's right. Our kind of flagship high definition products, um, HD Cam. HD Cam is our broadcast standard production system. So HD Cam is really where we want all mainstream television productions to be today. Um, UK, rest of Europe and internationally because it's a format that works across the globe. So Neil, what do we have here? What we're showing is Final Touch. Um, Final Touch is a real-time colour correction and grading system that works on the Apple Mac. It works particularly well with Final Cut Pro um, and it's a, a real-time system for finishing TV high definition and film productions. Now, I understand that high definition is causing a bit of a problem for editors yeah. for the final touch, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, high definition's brought an increase in quality, bigger pictures, um, and more detail. And the knock-on effect of that is editors and graders are having to spend more time correcting, balancing shots, dealing with blemishes on actresses' faces, dealing with poor lighting conditions. Um, because the consumer is going to be viewing a bigger picture, so the quality has got to be, ad got to be addressed. And you can do all of that, just the lights and get rid of the blemishes, which sounds fantastic, just for the touch of a button. Yeah, absolutely. We can adjust all of our colours, reds, greens, blues. If someone's looking too pale, we can adjust that in real time, give her the Hollywood suntan that she always wanted. Um, yeah, it's great. And that's Kylie. She looks amazing. Could you make me look beautiful? Well, I'm not sure about that. Some of the biggest technological advances in recent years have been in graphics and gaming, and Lightweight 3D have been at the forefront of these innovations. But what exactly is Lightweight 3D? 
Well, it's a, a package for creating the geometry that, that you make fake objects with. So it might be a, an aircraft that you're crashing into the ground or flying along with. It might be a spaceship uh, uh, you're flying in space with. Those sort of things. So creating objects that you could not normally create and really was uh, the first mass, I suppose, animation package uh, available to the public that took off worldwide. Dominates the American TV industry, about 40% of all the animation seats. And, uh, and really dominates in the UK as well. And where would I have seen Lightweight 3D being used? Well, uh, obviously lots of films. I mean, things like uh, a little bits have been used in the Star Wars movies, but things like Serenity, all done with Lightwave, um, The Aviator, all the Leonardo DiCaprio shots where he's inside the cockpit, all of that's done with Lightwave. His blue screen, uh, or in that case, green screen seats and uh, 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 being shot, and actually all then the glass and the canopy and all of that is put in around him, all completely in computer graphics, all done in Lightwave. And there was me thinking he was a pilot. Shucks, you had me fooled. Unfortunately not. <laughs> now, this equipment is mainly used by broadcasters. It's what we call high-end. But what's the real difference between what you supply and what the rest of us can buy in the high street? The basic difference is, uh, at home, you're actually working with analogue signals. So it comes in digital through a set-top box and comes out analogue. These screens are actually digital, so in a broadcast environment, digits come out of your camera and we feed this directly into digits so there's no compromisation on, on the actual quality of what you're seeing. It's pure digit all the way through and that's why broadcasters buy these. So we're talking the creme de la creme? The creme de la creme, you know, all Sky Studios, all the OB vehicles, they use these screens because these are professional screens and you couldn't drive them with anything else other than cameras which cost £80,000 or VTRs that cost £80,000. No. And that's the difference. There, there must be uh, some private clients that are not broadcasters. That's true. Um, we have people who want this technology, and for that reason, we actually have set-top boxes and DVD players that actually produce a digital output. You can't buy that elsewhere, but we provide that for people, clients, uh, such as footballers and people. There's so much fantastic equipment here, but things never used to be like this. Oh, no. This is a mutoscope. It comes from the late 19th century, and it's the first form of moving image. It was the forerunner to the cinema and to TV, I guess. And in fact, how it worked is you would put a penny in the slot, and then you would turn the handle, and you would get a minute's worth of film. So I guess possibly one of the first pay-per-views? Absolutely. <laughs> well, as nice as it seems, I still think I probably prefer all my modern gadgets. Now, it's not really the big boys that are producing superior quality, is it, Tim? No, it's certainly not. No, quite the opposite. I think quite, the, you know, it's, it's the small man. It's, it's the me TV now, I think. And uh, as you can see around the show, it's the smaller companies that are emerging and not the big companies. In fact, some of the larger ones that were here last year, they're not here this year. Because the margins aren't there because of the, of the, the investment required. Is, I, I say now it's a noughts difference. You know, anything that was 100,000 is now 10,000. Anything that was 10 is 1. And that's opening it right up to a whole new market. And uh, I think for the first time, I can honestly say that you and I could go out, buy equipment, we could produce content, and we could air it nowadays, buying you know, low-cost TV time, having a website, broadband, and all this sort of stuff. And we can put out better content than is currently going out by the national broadcasters. High definition. We don't have high-def TV yet but you can have it in your home with your own equipment and to me that is absolutely amazing. The IPTV market has an estimated value of $800 billion in the next couple of years. It's also been described as an extremely disruptive technology. Is that why they call you punk TV, Jim? Yeah, possibly. I think um, IPTV has been described as punk television by the creators of punk simply because at the end of the 70s punk rock came out and what punk rock was all about was like taking granddad's shirt and your dad's trousers and an old pair of shoes and then going having fun making music. But basically what punk did was it was so successful it rocked the very spine of the music industry. Well what we think IPTV, IPTV will do will be exactly the same. It will rock the very spine of broadcast industry because you can put a television channel together for a few hundred pounds, 200, 300, 400 pounds. You go, you buy second hand stuff, you go to eBay, you patch it together. There's no designer labels, there's nothing fancy. And because it's delivered over broadband, which is just the internet, it works. It's like a magazine market now. 
you don't have to have like 50,000 or 100,000 viewers to make IPTV work. It works with 500 viewers because it's so cheap. So if you want to set up in your bedroom like local radio or public access in America and you want to spend 500 quid setting it up and then you want to go day by day, you can. So what you're basically saying is anyone can produce, direct, edit and present their own television programme. Absolutely. Are you trying to put me out of a job, Jim? Um, yeah, possibly. Anyway, joining me on my show today is... <laughs> if you want to see a man about a van, what about this one? Hi, John. Hello. What's this all about? Well, this is one of the first uh, outside broadcast vans that we know of that's been put together specifically to serve the internet media streaming market. And uh, what sort of stuff do you actually stream? Well, anything you like that's live. Uh, we, we have done in the past uh, football matches, cricket matches, any sporting event. We've done corporate uh, presentation events. We've done live concerts, anything you like. So it's basically live pictures to your PC? Yes, that's what it does. And uh, what sort of quality is it? Well, basically, uh, because we can get up to one megabit off the, uh, off the dish on the roof, you can get to as, as good as TV picture quality. Um, usually for the internet, though, that's not necessary. Oh, sounds good to me. I look forward to seeing my next sports programmes. Right, thank you very much, Don. Uh, I think it's time to go back inside. In the 80s, the big battle for the home entertainment market was between VHS and Betamax, and we all know who won that. This time, it's with Blu-ray and HD DVD, and I wonder who's going to win this one. No one's exactly sure at the moment, really. It's Toshiba versus Sony. Um, who's got the most amount of money, the biggest PR battle. There are some physical differences between the two formats, um, particularly Blu-ray's got slightly bigger capacity than HD-DVD. Um, it's got a few more studio backers on, on Blu-ray's side than HD-DVD, but studios are quite fickle. They, they, they change allegiances quite quickly. No one really knows for certain at the moment. What actually is the difference? Well, actually, the difference between Blu-ray and HD-DVD, Blu-ray has a bigger capacity, um, Blu-ray has um, a slightly more interactive ability than, than Hasty DVD. They've both got advanced, it's, it's kind of DVD on steroids. Um, both formats uh, are able to, to take the consumer into a much more kind of internet-based uh, environment. Uh, you can do lots of Java programming, buy the T-shirt after, after you watch the, after you watch the disc. But, but really, once again, there's, there's not a huge difference between them. It's going to be much more of a marketing war. So I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. We're just going to have to wait and see. Well, that's it from this year's show. Until next year, goodbye.